Anatoly. Is the day spring? Good morning, church. Good morning. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and we'll be glad. Uh, the psalm says in Psalm 150, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Good morning, day spring. It is our call to worship. I want you to get on your feet. I want you to give God some praise. Give God some glory as we worship and we magnify his holy name. Day spring. Good morning. Hallelujah. What a wonderful day it is to be here today. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We serve an awesome God and we want to give him all of the glory, all of the honor and all of the praise. Blessing, blessing, blessing and honor, glory, glory and power. We're gonna be the end to the ancient of days. From every nation, From every nation, all of creation, all of creation. We're gonna bow we're bound for the ancient of days. Never return. Every time in heaven and earth, we, we shall, shall declare, declare your glory and every. We worship you, because you will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away. Oh, ancient oh, of days, yeah, yes, he's ancient of days. Sing blessing, blessing and honor, glory, glory and power. We're gonna be to the ancient of days from every nation, from every nation all, of creation, all of creation we're gonna bow, bow for the ancient of days and every, every time in heaven and earth we shall declare your glory and every nation shall bow we throne. worship you in worship but you will be exalted O oh God Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high, he is an awesome God. And he is worthy of praise because his kingdom shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancients of day. For none can compare to your matchless word. Sing to the ancient We're gonna sing that again. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless word. Sing to the ancient of days. And never return. Cause you will be exalted, yes, oh you God. will. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Yeah. Come on, don't stop your worship. Don't stop your worship. He's in the room today. Come on, give it up if he's a good God, if he's a mighty God, if he's a righteous God. Come on. Do better 
than that. We're the King of Kings. You are, you are, you are the truth. How many of you believe it? You are, you are, you are the truth. Sing you are. You are, you are, you are the truth. You are, you are, you are, you are the truth. Sing you are the truth and the light. You are the truth and the light. It's always the truth and the light. It's always the truth and the light. Truth and the light. Sing you are the truth and the light. You are the truth and the light. It's always the truth and the light. It's always the truth and the light. Truth and the light. You are my hope. How many of you need hope in this place today? You are, you are, you are my hope. Sing you are. You are, you are, you are my hope. You are, you are, you are, you are my hope. Sing you are my hope and You are my hope and I know there's somebody in here that needs that today. You are, you are, you are my peace. Sing you are. You are, you are, you are my peace. You are, you are, you are, you are my peace. Sing you are my peace and joy. You are my peace and joy. With everything when falling, everything peace failing, and joy. With everything and when failing, everything peace falling, and joy. Peace and joy. Everything that's right and everything that's true, God is you. Everything that's good and everything that's right and everything that's true, God is you. Everything that's good, everything that's right. Everything that's right. Time. It's time for us to give our offering. Let's give God some praise. 
I need to let you know that the Bible tells us in the book of Malachi that to bring all of your tithes and all of your offerings into the storehouse. And I want to challenge you this morning to be obedient in what God is telling us to do from the word of God. In 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, it says, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly, but if you sow bountifully, you will also reap bountifully. And so I want you to be generous in the gift that you are giving as you're sowing into this ministry. And we're believing God to pour back into you a blessing, some 30, some 60, and 100 fold. Be generous in this season. Also want to remind you to make sure that you sow into the pastor love offering, that you sow into the love offering to be a blessing to Dr. Ash in this season of his life. As we know that even though it's a pandemic, guess what? Our pastor still has needs. His needs need to be provided. So we want to challenge you today to make sure that you're generous in your love offering towards the pastor. God bless you. All right, we got a couple quick announcements for you on today. I'm going to mark your calendars accordingly. Next Sunday, August the 2nd at 10 a.m., we'll have another drive-in service, a drive-in church. And we just want you to come on out and to participate. We're excited with our worship experience on the parking lot. It's been great for us to come together, to see each other, to fellowship together. The praise team has been on point. The preacher has been preaching. So we're just really excited about that. The gates open at 9 a.m. The gates open at 9 a.m. And by it being the first Sunday of the month, it's our communion Sunday. So we'll have communion in the cars also. So on next Sunday, we want you to invite your family and friends to come out and to participate in the drive-in church experience. Also, I want you to mark your calendars for next Wednesday night is Bible study, it's focal point. We want you to be aware of that, that it's our time that we come together, we get into God's word as a church family, we dissect God's word, and that it is a blessing to spend time and to dwell in the word. Second Timothy, uh, the second chapter around the 14th and 15th verse says that we need to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. And so we're doing that on Wednesday night at our Bible study at 7 p.m. Also, we want to mark your calendars for uh, next Saturday, August the 8th, we're doing a yard sale. And we need for everyone to be registered by this Friday coming up, July the 31st. We need you to be registered so we know how many tables uh, to get for the yard sale. And so we want you to be aware that the cost for the tables will be $10. It'll be Saturday, August the 8th from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And, uh, to 2 p.m. I'm sorry, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so we want you to make sure that you are aware of that. So if you're going to register, we need you to register as soon as possible so we know how many tables to get. I want you also, brothers, to mark your calendars. Let's get excited about this. That on Saturday, August the 15th, on Saturday, the August the 15th, at 6 a.m., we're doing our virtual men's breakfast. Our virtual men's breakfast. Saturday, August the 15th at 6 a.m., our virtual men's breakfast. And we're excited that Dr. Ash will be coming and he'll be ministering to us from the topic Forged in the Fire. That is Forged in the Fire. So we want you to come on out and participate. We got some other announcements that we're going to give to you on that day. We're excited about what is about to take place as we move into the next season of our men's ministry. The last announcement is that um, this week, me and my wife, we officially got our Pennsylvania driving license. And as we were getting our driving license, they asked this question, are you registered to vote? And so we registered to vote as we were getting our driver's license. And I wanna challenge you today, if you have not registered to vote, we need you to get out and get yourself registered to vote so that when November gets here that you can have a voice in the election. No matter whether you're a Republican, no matter whether you're a Democrat or you're independent, you still have the right to vote. So we need to make sure that you are registered to vote. God bless you. I don't know about you today, but I call him Savior. I call him savior because 45 years ago, he saved me. He reached into my darkness and brought me into the marvelous light. As you read the 66 books of the Bible, you'll find that there are a lot of people 
from Genesis to Revelation who have discovered that Jesus is the Messiah. He was either the Messiah they were looking for or the Messiah that they found. And even today, there are some still looking for the Messiah, Jesus, who has already revealed himself to all of us. And those who were healed and those who were fed and those who were loosed and those who were protected and those who were kept by Jesus, there is no wonder they call him him the Savior. Today, I want to let you know I call him Savior. Those of you who have given your life to Jesus Christ, today you must call him Savior. And I'm going to give you some reasons why you should call Jesus Savior right out of the Bible. There are things that Jesus did that when you read the stories and his involvement in people's lives, there's no way that you could call him anything but the Savior. If you would turn in your Bibles to Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 23, Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 to 43, with the focus on verse 43. And again, I want to remind you that what we're talking about today is it's no wonder they call him the Savior. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The only thing more outlandish that in this passage is the fact that the thief had the nerve to ask Jesus for something he didn't deserve. The other outlandish thing is that God, Jesus, granted him what he asked for. Some say that you are valuable if you're pretty. Some say you have value if you're smart. There are others who say you have value by the place you live, by the degree that you have, by the car that you drive. The fact that you can play basketball, rise above the rim and dunk. Some of us don't feel like we're worth anything if we don't have a doctor before our name or a Ph.D. after our name. Some say you're valuable only if you have a six figure salary. I want you to know that Jesus sees value in each and every person. God is the one that sent Jesus to die for the whole world. The whole world, regardless of what your performance is, God, Jesus, have worked very hard and diligently to be able to save you. If you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have come to save you. And here we find a man who didn't have anything. According to the 21st century rule of success, we have two criterias that really make you valuable and worth anything. And those two things are appearance, and performance. If you look good, you must be good. If you perform well, then you must be worth something. Now understand this, that a man's value system is all messed up. A salesman defends what he's selling only because he wants to practice not having ethics. So if he doesn't have ethics and he makes the sale, then that's okay. We have those things in this day and age that are black and white, but we don't have a problem coloring them gray. Where we live today, it's hard to find truth from the lie. We hear a lie, but we don't treat it like a lie. We hear the truth and we don't treat it like the truth. We color them both together and we come out with all shades of gray. You know, many people, they want to elevate the body but degrade the soul. Some people today want to pamper the skin, but pollute the heart. 
In this passage of scripture today, we have a man who couldn't offer anything to God because of his performance, because of his lifestyle. I don't know why Jesus held up dying long enough to save this sinner, but I do know this, that all of us, each and every person watching and listening to this message, all of us are criminals. All of us have stolen something from Jesus. All of us are thieves. We've stolen his glory. We raise our children and we take credit for the way we raise them. We get our degrees and diploma and we take credit for our intelligence. We marry a person that we brag about that is more than a trophy person. And yet and still we don't give God any of the glory. We spend most of our time taking from God what God has done for us. We've convinced other people that we are heading nowhere and there's no destiny. Some people today feel like all you have to do is live out this life because there's nothing at all after this life. God says that man is, is heading somewhere. You're either heading toward heaven or towards hell. You're heading somewhere and there is a destiny. But there are people in this world today that would have you believe that when this life ends, there is no afterlife. There is no place. There is no destiny. I want you to know that this man, this rugged man who is hanging on one of the crosses on either side of Jesus, the one man who represents part of us. Some of us who have not yet given our lives to Christ are like the one thief, the one criminal on the cross. The others who have given their life to Christ, you can't take credit for giving your life to Christ. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It was a gift of God. And isn't it amazing that God, Jesus, held up dying long enough to help this man that really, according to the world, didn't have a whole lot to offer. This man didn't do a real good job of living life while he was here. But then Jesus offers him something called eternal life. Can you can you see it? No wonder they call him savior. You don't have to perform for Jesus. You, you don't have to be successful. You, you don't have to be always right. You don't have to always get everything perfect. With Jesus, all you have to do is call upon his name. If you can confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is, then you can be saved. Listen, this man deserved hell, but got heaven. No wonder they call him savior. What is God, Jesus, trying to teach us in this passage? What is he trying to prove by pardoning this man? I don't know about you, but some of you feel like you're worthless. Some of you feel like you deserve death. Some of you feel like you're a loser. Well, I want you to understand, identify with this passage today because it's no wonder they call him savior. No matter where you find yourself today, no matter what side of the law you find yourself on, no matter how many mistakes you've made in your past, no matter how many trips and falls you make in your future, I want you to understand that none of us are better than this man that was hanging on the cross next to Jesus. And I want you to know that man, if he were to testify today, he would say, no wonder they call him savior. I want you to know something about this. This ex-con right now is, according to scripture, running around heaven, grinning, because he called him savior. What the world wanted to do was just crucify him and hope that he died because of the things that he did. The truth be known that all of us have done things that is worthy of hell. But God, when he hung on the cross at Calvary, he, he hung on that cross, building a bridge between heaven and earth. He's offered this thief. He's offering you an opportunity to receive him as Lord and Savior so that you can go from earth to heaven, that you can bypass hell. You don't have to go to hell unless you make a decision to do that. Just like this thief, we all deserve hell, but God has offered us heaven. I want to tell you about a story 
of two prowlers, two, two thieves, two burglars who broke into this department store. They broke in undetected and they were there for a few hours. They came out of the department store not having stolen anything. What they did was they came, they left, and didn't get caught. The next morning they came back to the store. Why? Because they were in the store not to steal anything, but to remove tags from items. They took $5 tags and put them on $100 items. They took $10 tags and put them on $300 items. They exchanged a lot of sale price tickets. Then when the store opened up the next morning, they went in and capitalized on the, the devalued merchandise. So when you look at this, you find that these people who worked in the store for four hours, they were given the prices on the tags that were attached to the, to, to the, to the stuff. So they would get some things a lot cheaper, so they would leave with all of these items that have been devalued. Four hours before they realized that what they were selling was undervalued and that the people who did this never ever got caught. They exchanged everything. Four whole hours before these people understood that what they were selling was devalued. Beloved, I want you to understand today that the world has put a value on you. They have said, if you're not this, then you're worth this. If you have this, you're worth this. So what the world has determined is your value. I don't know about you, but here's what I believe, that if Jesus shed his priceless blood for you, then your value ought to be priceless. But in the world today, you have politicians and other people telling you that you belong in a certain place because of your ethnicity, because of your uh, uh, ability to make money, because of the education that you have or didn't have. Everybody's trying to devalue everybody, but I want you to know this. No wonder they call him savior because he's proving in this passage that no matter how much you have done against the kingdom of God, that there is still an opportunity for you to receive him as Lord and savior and bypass hell and get to heaven, even right now. There are many of you that are watching this message and what you've done is you have bought into what people have called you. Some have called you dumb. Some have told you that you're never going to amount to nothing. There are people always trying to change the value that you have. But Jesus recognized the value of this man that others saw no value in. And what he did was he decided to hold up dying long enough to be able to help this worthless man to people, but priceless man to God, to be able to transition from where he was into paradise. Today, not tomorrow, you will be with me in paradise. Beloved, it's no wonder they call him savior because he has no precondition for the existence of his godliness. He wants to really save you today. As I'm looking at this stuff, I'm just really out. I'm just outdone. Because the next time a trickster tries to tell you that you are worth the bargain basement price, the next time somebody tries to pass you off as cheap, you need to remember that he is the savior. They're trying to tell you that you don't have a destiny. And if you don't have a destiny, that means you don't have a duty. And there are too many people today that feel like there is no destiny, that they have been born, they've been created without a destiny. And that's not true. Because if you ascribe to the fact that you have no destiny, then you have no responsibility or duty. And that's why there are so many people today who walk down the aisle who read the prayer of salvation and don't change because they don't feel they have a duty. They don't feel they have to serve. 
there are some that don't feel, even though they call themselves Christians, that they don't have to tithe. There are some that feel all you have to do is mouth with you, just mouth these words and you will be saved. Well, the Savior requires more than that. He says you need to understand that you were created to do great things. He says if you decide you don't have a destiny, then you won't assume responsibility or obligation. You won't be able to then acknowledge the fact that you've been created to do something great. If a man does not have a destiny, then they have no guidelines or goals. If you feel like you don't have a destiny, then you don't have the difference. You don't have to decide right from wrong. See, if you were to ascribe the fact that you don't have a destiny, then you have less faith than the criminal on the cross because he recognized that there was a destiny even past his severe sin. Who is to say a husband can't leave his wife and family if you don't have a sense of right and wrong? Who's to say you can't abort a fetus? fetus? Who's to say that you can't shack up? Who's to say that you can't do these things? See, if you don't have a destiny, then you have no urgency to become like Jesus. What we do is we just continue to live life. And the bottom line of a life like that that does not perceive destiny is disaster. I don't know about you, but in today's vernacular, in today's life that we live, there are a bunch of people who've given up hope. When you decide as a 21st century Christian or a person who is living out and through the pandemic and through the loss of jobs and through all of the other pain that's created, financial and otherwise today, and feel like you don't have a destiny, that because you can't get a job, you have no hope, because you can't uh, pull yourself out of the pandemic, you have no hope. You need to remember this thief, this criminal on the cross. He, in the midst of being hanging on a cross, he had a sense of destiny beyond death. You who know the Bible, you who have studied the Bible, you who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, for you to not have hope and a sense of destiny, you are worse than the thief on the cross that asked Jesus to remember him. You are like the thief on the cross that doesn't have a clue and doesn't care about what the future is. As a matter of fact, has adopted the philosophy of there is no destiny. When I die on the earth, there's nothing after earth. You have to decide today, do you have the faith of the criminal on the cross? And are you able to call out to Jesus today? Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And it's no wonder they call him Savior. Beloved, today I'm so grateful that I called him Savior back in 1975. Since 1975 to this day, I'm not going to say that I didn't have uh, areas and times that I didn't fall down, but God has picked me back up. I'm not going to say that I haven't sinned, uh, but God has overlooked the sin. I, I want you to know that there are things that God did that demonstrated the fact that he is not only the savior that saves you, but he's the savior that keeps you. I have no question about the fact that this criminal that day, was walking with Jesus in paradise. Now, while Jesus died, the other thief died, the other criminal died, the criminal that ex accepted Jesus Christ died, but one went into the bosom of Abraham and the other went into Hades. Beloved, your decision is today. I know the devil wants to tell you you ain't worth nothing. I know he wants you to try to figure out why would God, why would God waste his time with you? Why would he overlook some of the things that you've done, some of the things you've thought, some of the things you've been a part of, some of the things that you still haven't gotten over? But you've got to understand, it's no wonder they call him Savior. When you look at how bad your life has been and how many mistakes you've made, remember this criminal on the cross. And with his last breath, with his breath fading out of his body, he decided that Jesus was the answer for his life. I don't care how old you are. 
But today must be the day that you yell out to God because no wonder they call him savior. The question today is, are you ready to call him savior? I challenge you today to not let another day go by without calling on the name of Jesus. Beloved, I want you to understand this pandemic is real. People are dying left and right. You don't need a pandemic to die. Jesus even said tomorrow's not promised to you. The fact that he said tomorrow's not promised to you, he didn't, he didn't bring up the pandemic when he made that promise that tomorrow's not promised to you. But certainly in this day and age, at almost any time we could pass. But I want you to know that this whole thing of life and death is fragile. That if tomorrow is not promised to you, if you don't make a decision today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have overlooked the fact that he has offered a hand to you, inviting you into the kingdom of heaven. To reject that hand is to ask Jesus to send you to hell. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. If you end up in hell, you are an intruder. But today, right now, I want you to pray this prayer after me, wherever you are. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have fallen short of your glory. I have done wrong after wrong. I have not only failed you, Jesus, but I failed in my marriage, in my parenting. I failed in the way I've lived life and the things that I've done. Forgive me for all of my sins and, wrong do and wrongdoings. Father, others have called on you and called you Savior. Today, I call upon you to be my Lord and my Savior. I confess my sins. Make me the person that you want me to be. I accept the destiny for which you created me. And I pray that one day I would be with you in heaven but until that day, I want you to give me the abundant life. And I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen. While you're still here, I don't want you to leave because I want you, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to reach out to us at Dayspring Ministries. And I want you to let us know what you've done. And if you need some help, some of you are in an area of a church, a Bible believing preaching church. If you know of a Bible believing preaching church, then get to that church as soon as you can. Let the pastor know what you've done, that you've prayed the prayer of salvation. And then I want you to make sure that you trust in the Lord for your destiny. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes. Are you going to fall down? Yes. But the Bible says the righteous fall down seven times and God gets them back up.